Welcome to MEM 16006, Organise and Communicate Information. Welcome to Pertech Learn and Developments. This lecture is a supplement to your student workbook and other resources made available to you. Make sure you have access to your student workbook as you'll need it to complete your online quiz and practical activities. In this unit, we'll be investigating organising and communicating information. Obviously an important skill for professional engineering tradespeople. What will we be learning today? This lecture has two parts. The first part is communication, communication methods and implications as an engineering tradesperson. The second section will be the organisation and use of information in engineering trades. Before we begin, let's have a look at how we get good or competent at something. What is competence? Let's look at the dictionary definition. Competence is a set of demonstrable characteristics and skills that enable and improve the efficiency or performance of a job. I think you'll agree that wasn't a very good example of uh, communication. Plain English version. What is competence? Let's ask ourselves a question. It'd be a lot easier to understand this way. Am I performing my tasks as expected by my employer, the industry, my peers, and society in general? Let's have a quick look at this formula. Don't panic. We're not doing mathematics. We're not doing algebra. We're not doing calculus. I found this cool formula on the uh, internet and I use it a lot because it really demonstrates what it takes to be good at something or competent at something. And it states, which does make a lot of sense, competence is 70% knowledge, 20% perseverance, 10% talent. That's interesting. Knowledge is more important than talent. It is a common misconception in society that just because you're good at one thing, you're going to be good at everything. This isn't true. This is called the halo effect, and we'll be looking at this in a bit more detail later on in the lecture. Persistence is important, but persisting at something the wrong way indefinitely won't get you any further. Don't get me wrong, perseverance is important, but with the correct knowledge, you're going to get results. Good reference materials are important. Reference materials are a key source of knowledge. It's impossible to remember everything, but it's easy to remember where things are. The Machinery's Handbook is an excellent resource for engineering tradespeople. Online knowledge and resources like PConnect are commonplace today. Let's have a look at our first section, which is communication and communication methods. What is communication? Let's look at the dictionary version. The act or process of using words, sounds, signs or behaviours to express or exchange information or to express your ideas, thoughts and feelings. Scientists to this day are still arguing about what was the most significant contribution to modern civilization? Communication or fire? What do you think? Scientists are constantly looking for signs of the first communication between our ancestors. I suppose a caveman hitting another caveman over the head with his club and stealing his mammoth was a form of communication. Over 90% of our communication is nonverbal. Smells, sounds, dances, vibrations, temperatures, colours, all make up forms of communication. For example, birds build impressive nests or have very colourful feathers to impress or attract a potential mate. Humans do the same thing. We have uh, sports cars and brightly coloured clothing to attract the opposite sex. Termites communicate through vibrations when a predator approaches their nest, the soldier termites bang their heads 
against uh, an objects to create vibrations and warn the rest of the colony. Let's have a look at the top 10 skills to make you a good communicator. Public speaking and professional skills. This could involve anywhere from presenting a sales pitch or just presenting to a customer or a workmate. Handy tips for public speaking. Practice your speech. Videotape yourself. Ask somebody to watch you presenting your speech. Get them to create distractions. Ask uh, difficult questions. Practice dealing with these situations. Have a script. Rehearse the script. Have a plan. What if something goes wrong? Do you have a plan B? How are you going to deal with difficult questions? Research your audience. Find out who you're talking to. Research your subject matter. Make sure you understand what you're presenting. And know your product well. Section two, persuasive skills. This doesn't mean being able to sell ashtrays to motorcyclists. It means, can you instill confidence in your customer? Can you get the customer to trust you and what you're saying? Some tips to be persuasive. Know your product. Try not to exaggerate. If you don't know the answer to something, tell them you don't know the answer and you'll get back to them with the correct information. Do not lie or oversell or misrepresent your product. Your body language is important. Preparation. Have empathy for the person or the client that you're communicating with and be aware on how you're communicating with your client. Make sure you know about your client and what they need. Interpersonal skills, section three. How good are you with people? Do you treat different people differently? Is unconscious bias affecting how you interact with people? Listening skills. Are you listening or do you even care what the other person is saying? Listening carefully and taking note what the other person is saying will instill mutual respect, increases your knowledge and increases your persuasiveness. Number five, communicating with empathy. It is important to look at the issue from the other person's standpoint. It promotes knowledge and increases your persuasiveness. Empathy is a two-way street, but it's not an excuse to be rude to somebody just because you're having a bad day. Empathy also means you having a bad day is not your customer or workmate's problem. Interestingly enough, a large portion of empathy is communication, over 30%. Number six, providing and assessing feedback. Feedback can be positive or negative. It all depends on the delivery. Feedback can sometimes be interpreted as an attack or criticism of somebody's work or efforts if not managed correctly. Skilled assessors can turn potentially contentious issues into positive things, even brainstorming sessions. Is my unconscious bias affecting my assessment? Teamwork and collaborating in groups, number seven. 
If you're like me, I hate working in teams, but we have to conduct ourselves professionally and contribute appropriately. Some questions to ask about your team or your team dynamics. Is your team being dominated by an overbearing or aggressive team member? Are personal grievances steering the team dynamics? Is the 20-80 rule applying where 20% of the team are doing 80% of the work? Is everybody in the team given a chance to contribute or are they shouted down or over dominated by the other team members? Some tips for team leaders. Have a clear agenda. Allow everybody uninterrupted time to present their ideas. Don't let people get interrupted or shouted down. Always approach any idea. There's no such thing as a silly idea. From silly ideas spring good ideas. Enforce participation. Make sure every single person in that team has an opportunity to speak or to contribute. Deal with overbearing and uh, over assertive team members. Not always the loudest person in the room is the smartest person in the room. This is my favorite. Number eight, nonverbal skills. Is your body language sending a different message to what you're articulating through your speech? Are you telling a, a customer or a workmate that you'll be happy to help them while your arms are crossed or while not looking at them in the eye? 90 to 93% of all communications non-verbal. How many of you are having trouble uh, communicating with people now that we have half our faces uh, covered with masks due to Corona? Body language key areas. Are we making eye contact or are we avoiding eye contact when we're talking to people? How are we standing? Are we standing with our hands in our pockets or our arms crossed in a defensive position? How are we sitting? Are we slouching? Are we having our legs crossed? Are we fidgeting? What about our facial expressions? Are we trying to be serious and smiling at the same time? Handshaking. A lot of businessmen spend thousands of dollars on coaching on how to uh, present themselves and shake hands and greet people, especially if you're an international business person. Different countries have different protocols. How do you dress? Your dress sense. What type of clothes are you wearing? And how you move your body parts. Are you waving your arms around while you're describing something? All these are key areas of uh, attention for body language. Number nine, phone skills. Phone skills. All the visual communication is missing during a phone conversation. Right ground for misunderstanding or even fraud. All my recent phone calls from the tax department have had someone with a foreign accent called Frank Jones telling me that they need my credit card details to clear a tax debt. Tips for effective phone communication. Adopt a positive tone. Be clear. Be sincere. Be personable. Was the conversation a win-win situation for both sides? Last but not least, number 10, written skills. The pen is mightier than the sword. Who hasn't heard this expression? Consider when you're writing an email or writing a letter or giving somebody some feedback. Would you communicate in the same way if you were with them face to face? Moving along, common problems associated with effective communication. Number one, unconscious bias. Number two, knowledge and skills. Number one, unconscious bias. Unconscious biases are social stereotypes about certain groups of people. 
Are you making assumptions about people even before you get to know them? Beauty bias. Are you assuming just because someone is beautiful that they are gifted or special? Are you more likely to be helpful or polite to someone who is good looking? Affinity bias. Are you subconsciously favoring someone that is from your ethnic, religious or socioeconomic background? The horns effect. Are you biased towards something because basically everybody else is? Information bias. Common amongst conspiracy theorists that compels people to seek out evidence that confirms their beliefs. For example, people who believe the earth is flat will consistently look up flat earth websites. Social media companies use this phenomenon to keep feeding you information based on your search history. Therefore, they feed you advertising uh, information. Attribution bias. Basically, if I fail the test, it's the teacher's fault. If I pass the test, it's because the teacher was great. Never my responsibility. Conformity bias will usually change their opinion not to rock the boat. This is my favorite, the halo effect. The idea that if somebody's good at one thing, they're good at everything. And we see this in time and time again. Sports people becoming politicians, business people becoming presidents of countries. We've already identified that being competent at something is only 10% talent. The rest of it's knowledge. Section two, knowledge and skills. Here's my favorite formula again. You can be talented and use that talent to persevere, but without knowledge, it's to no avail. Don't know about you, not too keen on having an ex-cricketer performing brain surgery on me. Section two, the organization and use of information in the engineering trades. What is workplace information or routine workplace information? Let's have a look. Section one, verbal information, receiving work instructions, giving work instructions, clarifying work instructions, providing feedback on work instructions, nonverbal, listening to colleagues, listening to customers, listening on the telephone, body language, reading material, reading and interpreting work instructions, reading forms and orders, reading magazines and brochures, reading and interpreting technical drawings, reading policies and procedures, written information, creating job sheets, filling out timesheets, filling out forms and orders, writing emails, writing letters. We have some examples of workplace information, products catalog, take five checklist, could be timesheets, work health and safety forms, safe operating procedures, risk assessments, material data sheets, effective writing. The pen is my head and a sword. We've all heard this. My boss used to say to me, you're only ever one mouse click away from disaster. So think before you send. Um, also, think before you speak. When I'm writing correspondence. Who's going to read this? Am I angry when I'm writing it? Have I been cleared in mind? Have I had a bad day, as they say? Could I be disrespectful to somebody? Could it be misinterpreted? Am I telling them too much? Am I showing a bad side of myself? Could somebody misrepresent what I'm saying? Sometimes when people write an important letter, a complaint, what they'll do is they'll draft it, they'll sleep on it, and review it the next day before sending. This is a very good strategy. The day, these days of emails and instant messaging, your messages live forever. They can be reproduced and forwarded millions of times a second. As the old saying goes, some mistakes are meant to last. 
think before you send or post. Key factors in communication. Is it readable? Is it easy to understand? Is it written in plain English? Is it appropriate? Is it suitable for the audience? Is it polite? Is there any unconscious bias inside my communication? Is it complete? Have I supplied everything I need to supply? Have I given all the facts, all the information? Is it correct? Is it accurate? Does it use correct spelling, grammar, punctuation? Is it in plain English? Organizing information is important. It's impossible, as said before, to remember everything. So we need to find out an easy way to remember where everything is. Part numbers and document numbers. Part numbers can be random or sequential or contain relevant information. They can contain information like clients, batches, parent assemblies, etc. Like the example we've got on the screen now. I had a friend who worked in a power tool shop and the profit margin was coded inside the item number. So the salesman knew exactly how much discount they could give away when the haggling process was underway. Most organizations will have standard procedures on handling information, referencing correspondence, etc. This information is usually described in the, you guessed it, SOP, Standard Operating Procedure. The date and reference numbers can be used to cross-reference and track down documents quickly. Create folders and subdirectories on your computer or mobile device. This can be done relatively simply and quickly. A spreadsheet with links can help you manage information. Plenty of templates available online for this. Here's an example of a drawing number with information embedded within. So we have a look here, we have the date, the part name, the version and the customer code, all incorporated into a drawing number. Document control can also be automated. Programs like Microsoft Teams, Lotus Notes, Dropbox, all include document tracking as standard features in their software. 